Great. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, thanks, everyone, for turning up, first thing. OK, I'd just uh, like to start off by thanking the centre and all the other organisations that have funded this research, and particularly the uh, students and postdocs and collaborators that have done much of the work that I'm going to be presenting here today. It's, it's more their work than mine. So humans are releasing around about 35 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. It's no, a truly staggering amount of CO2. Around about 45% of that CO2 remains in the atmosphere, 30% is taken up by the ocean, some by the land sinks, and as a result of that we have two major threats, uh, global warming and ocean acidification. And these, both of these changes to physical processes are going to have very significant effects on populations, communities and marine ecosystems. Uh, there's no doubt about that. We can already see through observations changes in things such as distributions and the timing of breeding and those sorts of events, changes in populations and in communities that are consistent with the predictions we would expect or we would make under climate change scenarios. There's also an, now a massive number of short-term experiments showing that many marine organisms are sensitive to the sorts of changes in temperature and pH and CO2 that are pro projected for the end of the century. But if we're really going to understand uh, what marine populations and ecosystems are going to look like uh, towards the end of the century, what we need to do is also understand the influence of acclimation and adaptation over coming generations. And this was really nicely demonstrated in the, the Hughes et al. paper in 2003 uh, in science. So we have to integrate both the sort of demographic impacts of climate change and ocean acidification with whatever scope there is for acclimation and adaptation if we're going to understand what these populations are going to look like in the future. Now, genetic adaptation, uh, as we know, is genetic change driven by selection uh, that's inherited from one generation to the next. Acclimation, in contrast, is physiological, behavioural or morphological changes, uh, adjustments without genetic selection. So it's phenotypic plasticity. But what we might expect in both cases is that the populations will be able to uh, improve their performance as the environment changes, so that we might have, for example, uh, some maximum uh, performance at a given temperature now, but hopefully through time, through either selection and adaptation or through acclimation, that uh, we could also, they could do, uh, have an pro uh, improved performance in the future. Now, acclimation is really particularly important because we have uh, rapid phenotypic response to environmental change. And this might be particularly important for relatively long-lived organisms for which genetic adaptation may be uh, more challenging. It also usually results in improved performance to uh, a new environment, so that's very important. Other critical issues are that it can allow time for genetic adaptation to catch up. And there may actually be interactions with adaptation such that acclimation can actually accelerate genetic adaptation. And there's some good theory starting to come out to suggest that this might be possible. So acclimation is actually a really, really important topic. And one thing we need to think about when we're talking about acclimation is what we might expect to see in a phenotypic trait of interest. So if we're looking at a performance trait and we want to see imagine what that uh, organism might do, what that trait, how that trait might perform in the future, what we're actually looking for or hoping to see is that in the future the performance trait would actually be the, pretty much the same as it is today. So we'd see no uh, change in that trait of performance, but there, of course there'd be some underlying change in either something like energetic acquisition or uh, physiological responses, genetic responses, genome responses that allow for that. So there'll be some plasticity underlying this uh, trait which is acclimating. Now there's basically three types of acclimation that we can consider. Reversible acclimation, this is what happens in adults uh, and it's the sort of thing that we know happens all the time, for example, with seasonal acclimation where organisms adjust their physiology, for example, winter versus summer. So that's well known, uh, very well studied. Developmental acclimation is also very well known. Uh, this occurs when an organism experiences a particular environment early in life and then that sets in uh, train developmental pathways that, allows, that allow it to actually cope with that environment better later in life. 
but this, uh, a new uh, process of acclimation, uh, it's been around of course for a long time in organisms, but one that we're just starting to understand is transgenerational acclimation, where there can be acclimation across generations. And what we have here is uh, transgenerational acclimation can be defined as environment where the environment experienced by the parents or earlier generations influences the offspring response to environmental conditions. And there's some good examples of this already out in the literature and one is uh, for Daphnia where they can produce this helmeted form that helps them uh, with pred uh, predators, helps reduce the risk of predation and if the parents experience the odour cues of their predators, then their offspring are more likely to have these helmeted forms and this actually is inherited for several generations. And this is uh, actually a, a part of a broader field called non-genetic inheritance and it's where uh, inheritance of traits is mediated by transmission to offspring of elements of the parental phenotype or the environment. And there's actually a really nice review on this by Russell Bondurianski uh, last year uh, in tree if you want to have a look and, and follow up on this. Now there are a number of ways that, uh, that parents can actually influence the quality of their offspring and transmit information to their offspring that might be helpful in a new environment. And these include things such as nutrients, uh, for example, uh, you can, they can uh, put different amounts of energy or uh, different factors into the yolk. Uh, into milk if it's actually organisms where, for example, mammals where the offspring are feeding directly from the parents. There can be somatic factors that are transmitted, for example, hormones and proteins, and these can be uh, transmitted in things such as the gametes, the placenta, or glandular secretion. So all of these things allow the parents to influence the quality of their offspring. But one of the most important and interesting ones is epigenetic state. And what we're starting to realise is that uh, there can be inheritance ac across generations without change in the uh, actual uh, DNA itself, but by influencing the actual expression of the genes. And this can occur through things such as DNA methylation or changes in the chromatin structure. And just to give you an example of how this can occur, uh, there's some really nice work done with rats where they found that just a single exposure to a particular fungicide causes ch uh, changes in the methylation, DNA methylation in sperm. And that alters male mate choice, disease prevalence and stress response. And it can be inherited for three generations. So I, I was blown away when I saw this example. And it really makes you think about some of the chemicals you're exposed to, that no single dose to a fungicide can change things such as uh, mate choice in mammals. So um, there's some interesting, <laughs> interesting sort of consequences for some of the, the chemicals that are floating around, maybe in coffee cups and things like that. Anyway, we've been looking at transgenerational acclimation to climate change and uh, two of the people who have been prime movers in this are Jenny Donaldson and Gab Gabby Miller, uh, who have been looking at the effects of uh, global warming, the predicted 1.5 to 3 degrees increase in temperature in the ocean and ocean acidification, the sort of 600 to 1,000 microatmosphere increase in PCO2 in the ocean. One of our uh, real model species has been this guy here, Acanthochromus polyacanthus, the spiny damselfish. Uh, we know that this fish has limited capacity for reversible acclimation as adults. Uh, if you expose them to 1.5 to 3 degrees higher temperature, there are very significant effects on their growth, uh, reproduction, aerobic performance. And this isn't, doesn't seem to be improved by extended exposure. So what we've been looking at is uh, rearing these fish for multiple generations now to look at the potential for developmental and transgenerational acclimation. And what Jenny did uh, in this experiment was uh, brought in eight breeding pairs and kept them at current day temperatures, then uh, reared their offspring up at either the current day temperature or uh, at current day or 1.5 or 3 degrees higher than the current day. Then uh, the next generation, there she reared the fish up either under those temperatures again or for the ones that were already at the higher temperatures continued those higher temperature lineages through. Now this is a really powerful design uh, because it allows you to actually look at uh, acute effects, developmental and transgenerational effects. So we can actually uh, test them at different temperatures and look for the acute effects of temperature on these fish. This allows us to look at developmental and this comparison here lets us look at uh, transgenerational acclimation. And so, just to show you the results of this work, uh, 
And, and this is you know, three to four years hard work rearing fish, and it all sort of comes down to one graph. So now this is a really important graph. Um, <laughs> What we've got here is factorial aerobic scope. You don't really need to worry about what that is too much, apart from the fact that it's the capacity to take up oxygen. And it basically, it's a really important uh, performance indicator because it's the ability to do any sort of aerobic work. What you can see is that we see, as expected, uh, where there's, for the acute effects, that performance to uh, ability to take up oxygen went down with increasing temperature. In the developmental lines, there was not much of a change. So developmental acclimation didn't help much. There seemed to be a, a small increase uh, in performance in the highest temperature, but not really that much. But in the transgenerational lineages, where the parents also experienced high temperature, we see complete compensation of this trait. And so the ability to take up oxygen comes back to control levels when the parents are also under those conditions. So here we have complete compensation in one generation of a very important physiological trait. Now, uh, we don't really know exactly what the mechanism here. It's clear, or it appears that you know, these offspring are being primed for improved performance uh, in the uh, new environment that they're experiencing. There is no indication of the sort of normal maternal traits that we might expect to see, maternal effects we might see, such as changes in yolk provisioning or offspring size and things like that. So what we think we're seeing here is a change in epigenetic state of the parents that's being transmitted through to the offspring and allowing them to do better in that uh, warmer environment. And we're looking at that now with uh, transcriptomic work and some uh, genomic work that's been conducted in uh, conjunction with the people at KAUST and that's a, quite an exciting project that's underway at the moment. So that's one story. The other one is related to CO2. Uh, how are the fish doing under elevated uh, CO2? And Gabby Miller did a very similar thing to Jenny, uh, except a slightly uh, more simplified design. In this case, it was using the cinnamon clownfish, and she brought uh, adult breeding pairs in and kept them for nine months under high CO2, under either control conditions or under a moderate or a high CO2. Then she reared up the offspring uh, under the same conditions as the parents, except for in the control, some of them were actually reared up under high CO2 as well, and there were three different temperatures. And in this case, what that allows us to look at is the acute effects of CO2 and the transgenerational acclimation component. What effect is there of having the parents under high CO2? And she saw very, very similar results to Jenny. So here we have uh, the three temperatures that were reared up. Two of the traits we looked at, standard length and survival. This is the control. So these uh, had control parents and they were reared up under control conditions. This is what we'd normally expect to see for standard length and survival. This is the normal way we do our experiments where we had these fish reared from hatching under high CO2 and you can see that there's a decline in their growth rates and there's a reduction in survival. And we'd um, no, conclude from that that, well, that's all very terrible and that uh, actually these things aren't going to do very well in a high CO2 world. But if their parents were also under high CO2, we saw complete compensation again and standard length and survival was uh, the same as uh, the controls. There's a slight interaction with temperature, but the main message from this is that parental <coughs> effects really mattered. Uh, what, the, what conditions the parents saw was really important. Now, I think a lot of you know that another uh, aspect of, of the work that we've been doing with carbon dioxide is that we've seen these dramatic changes in behaviour, very significant and important changes in behaviour for fish that have been reared up under high CO2, that have been hatched and reared up under high CO2, such as things like inability to discriminate between different settlement cues or between predators and non-predators. And, in fact... Uh, they even become attracted to cues that they would normally avoid, such as they become attracted to the smell of predators if they've been reared up under high CO2, something that they normally don't do. So we, of course, were interested in how, uh, if uh, parental effects might uh, help ameliorate that, and we're just starting to look at that. Some of the other things that we've seen with high CO2 is, for example, that they are more active and that they are bolder, and therefore their predation rates go up under uh, normal circumstances. Recently, we've done some work at the CO2 seeps in Papua New Guinea. And these are valuable locations because uh, these sedentary fishes that live in these seeps and other sedentary organisms, once they at least settle from the plankton, they're basically living in this high CO2 environment their whole life. So this gives us a capacity to look for de developmental acclimation. Is there any obvious acclimation that happens given that these animals at least settle 
in these environments. And in fact, we found that no, there isn't. For the, the behavioural traits that we look at, we still see that they're attracted to predator odour and they're not just in control reefs just 100 metres away and they're more active and they're bolder and they're not on control reefs just 100 metres away. So uh, developmental acclimation is not helping them. So we need to again look for either adaptation or transgenerational acclimation. And uh, the first work that we've been doing the, on this, um, that Bridie Allen's been doing in conjunction with, with our lab, um, it's very interesting. We're seeing a very complicated story here, where in some cases we are seeing, for some traits, acclimation, some partial, and some no transgenerational acclimation. So these are uh, the, some early results that we've got. We're doing a lot more work in this area. And this is for uh, young fish uh, that were caught in light traps exposed to high CO2, um, oh, sorry, it's not at all. Uh, this is for fish that were reared in the lab and that their parents had been under high CO2. I got uh, thrown by the fact that Bridie's got a nice photo there uh, standing, carrying a light trap. <laughs> um, so these, the parents were under high CO2. We've reared the, the offspring up under high CO2 uh, or we've just switched them to a high uh, CO2 environment as per the previous experiments and then given them a threat and seen how they res responded. Now, in the first graph here, you can see that, in fact, there was uh, full acclimation, full transgenerational acclimation. So this is a proportion of non-responders. It was much higher, there were much higher non-responders to the threat uh, when they were just reared up under high CO2. But if their parents were under high CO2 as well, it was the same as controls. So complete acclimation, fantastic, of a behavioural trait. Uh, if we look at time to maximum speed being reached to actually avoid that threat, uh, it was intermediate. So there was not a complete acclimation. There's still some lag. Uh, if we then look at the, dis the direction that they actually turned, there was no acclimation in that. So it looks like this is going to be a complex uh, uh, thing to, to deal through, to work through particularly with behaviour, and that, in fact, there will be some traits that, are, that we do not see transgenerational acclimation at all. And in some other experiments we're doing right at the moment that Meg Welsh is doing, we've got very good evidence for that, that it seems that in some other really important traits there's no acclimation. So just to uh, wrap up, uh, transgenerational acclimation is potentially really a powerful mechanism, I think, by which populations can adjust to rapid climate change. We need to consider that uh, when we're trying to project what populations, how they will respond in the future. Um, epigenetic inheritance is probably likely involved in many of these instances and it's a really rapidly emerging field. It's been sort of no, a major field in medicine for a while now, but it's, I think it's something that's going to really take hold in evolutionary uh, biology uh, quite fast. Uh, as a result of this, no, it may actually take several generations to see the full c potential for acclimation in uh, in organisms and their plasticity to be expressed. And so some of these experiments are going to be quite challenging, but we're going to have to do them. Um, and it does mean that short-term experiments may not be really adequate for uh, projecting long-term consequences. There's a whole lot of unanswered questions. I think it's going to be a great field uh, to, to work on over the next few years. Uh, will short-term acclimation responses actually uh, transmit to long-term persistence? We don't know that yet. No, we're working in the lab. We don't know if this really means long-term persistence. Uh, do transgenerational effects affect the rate of adaptation? That's going to be critical to understand, and we don't know that yet. There's only theory out there that it might, uh, so there's some exciting work to do there. We don't know whether there could be transmission of pathological states. So now if organisms are exposed to pollution, for example, does that mean actually they're going to transmit um, no, epigenetic uh, effects to their, their offspring that might actually be detrimental? We don't know that. Um, and how widespread is this amongst marine taxa and can we actually use it to predict which uh, species might benefit uh, and hopefully we'll start to get some of those answers over the next three to four years. Thank you very much.